Hello. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. We're glad to have you here. Welcome to what the International Law Society is presenting as a discussion on nuclear disarmament with the great American ambassador, featuring U.S. Ambassador Thomas Graham, Jr. My name is Kevin Krauss, and I'm the president of the International Law Society here at Widener Law, and I'll be your master of ceremonies for the evening. We're hoping to make this event a part one of part two. And the part two will take place in the spring. And what we'll do is we'll invite many of you to come back and to have a brainstorming session with us in which we will then create some sort of a position policy paper, which we'll then send to the US government and possibly the United Nations as well. So we hope to all see you in the spring. And at this time, I would like to say on behalf of the International Law Society and Widener Law as a whole, we'd like to present our two speakers with two small gifts. Oh. Before we say anything. <laughs> <laughs> you have to excuse my, uh, my lack of knowledge on procedure in this ambassador. <laughs> well, if you would like, we can wait for the formalities. For the <laughs> But they're there you, for when you're you, ready. You may want to wait. We may say <laughs> you don't like it. I don't think we'll have to worry too much about that. Well, Professor Granoff is uh, Widener Law's own adjunct international law faculty member. And he, is, he will be interviewing Ambassador Graham. And he's, uh, Professor Granoff is regarded as one of the world's foremost experts in the field of nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation. And he has participated in many noteworthy dialogues with very influential people, such as former Soviet President Mikhail, Mikhail Gorbachev, scientist and US, UN Messenger of Peace, Dr. Jane Goodall, former US Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, actress and humanitarian, Christy Brinkley, and media mogul and philanthropist, Ted Turner. He currently serves as the president of the Global Security Institute, an organization with an aim of nuclear disarmament through rule of law initiatives. So without further ado, please welcome Ambassador Thomas Graham, Jr. and Professor Jonathan Granoff. Well, I first want to uh, thank Andy Strauss for bringing me to Widener, and I particularly want to thank the students in the international law class that I've had the privilege of teaching along with my colleague, uh, James Rainey. I hope he's here. Where, there he is. There's Professor Rainey. Um, we have some feedback. Is there some something we could do about that? Hello. There you go. You fixed it. No. Yeah, no, we're still getting it. Is it better? No. Maybe if you turn that off a little. There it is. Okay. No. You got to turn it off. Computer off. <laughs> Is the audio guy Wait, still here? Did he leave? OFF. Yeah. There I have it is. No idea. <laughs> no. I just muted this, this mic. Okay. Is it okay now? Is it better now? It's better. Okay. Thank you very much. It's still there's still feedback, and it'll be. Thank you. Thanks. That's why we are concerned about nuclear weapons. We don't have a lot of faith in the infallibility of technology. <laughs> you should have even less faith in the uh, infallibility of human beings. Yes. <laughs> uh, Ambassador Graham, since the 1970s, has been one of the most prominent uh, architects of protecting the world. That's a very strong statement. And the substance of it is backed up by the following evidence. He was instrumental in obtaining the following web of treaties which constitute the relationships amongst the states of the world that we all depend upon in our daily lives everywhere in the world. He was instrumental in obtaining the Biological Weapons Convention, which bans biological weapons universally, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which bans chemical weapons universally, the START-1 Treaty, the START-2 Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, 
The Treaty on Conventional Arms Forces in Europe, which was so important in the transition from the Cold War to the world that's uh, much more secure today. The INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. The SALT II Treaty. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. He served as uh, the acting director of the Arms Control Disarmament Agency, the acting deputy director of the Arms Control Disarmament Agency, the legal counsel of the Arms Control Disarmament Agency, and he was the plenipotentiary ambassador of the United States during the Clinton administration. Now what that means is, unlike just a normal ambassador whose position is extremely important, a plenipotentiary ambassador has the full agency of the United States government and thus the United States citizenry. A plenipotentiary ambassador has the authority to sign treaties on behalf of the United States. It's the most distinguished position that an ambassador can have. I find it egregious that we know the names of our best basketball players, football players, <laughs> and military leaders, and the people who prevent bad things from happening, diplomats, and who advance the rule of law as a way of obtaining security, and cooperation amongst people and communication are altogether often on the margins of the public consciousness. But for the grown-ups of the world, for people who really look at how things work, and I hope, I hope that, that all of you uh, law students realize the responsibility that you have being, you will be privileged members of society as members of the bar. Um, that we have to act as grown-ups and look at things as they really are. Before I ask some really interesting questions that we've prepared for Ambassador Graham, I also want to highlight that after he left government service, he's remained extremely active in civil society organizations. He was the president of Lawyers Alliance for World Security. Lawyers Alliance for World Security was an organization of lawyers that during the Cold War, while he was serving in government, brought lawyers from the then Soviet Union to the United States and sent lawyers from the United States to the Soviet Union who were instrumental in building bridges to help end the Cold War. Presently, he's the chairman of the Bipartisan Security Group. <laughs> bipartisan Security. Fact is, he's a Republican. Um, <laughs> I was once yeah. a Democrat. <laughs> uh, 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 the Bipartisan Security Group, which is a program of the Global Security Institute, of which I'm the president, and he serves on the board of directors. And he is also the co-chair of the American Bar Association's International Law Section's Blue Ribbon Task Force on Nuclear Nonproliferation. So he has continued uh, with a, an and has many, many wonderful books, which I, uh, I think we've brought a couple of them for, for people to take uh, that I strongly recommend if you have a serious interest in arms control and uh, nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament, as well as space weaponry. So without further ado, Ambassador Graham, where do you come from? Where were you raised? I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, far from the East Coast. And uh, I grew up there. My high school, the name of my high school was Louisville Male High School. <laughs> and the words meant what they said. Uh, just to give you an example of uh, how things can be different in different regions, in, in my city, in my region, uh, co-education was the hot button topic, not uh, racial integration. After the uh, 54 decision, high schools were quickly integrated, black and white, but the decision to integrate boys and girls was one of the biggest battle, biggest political battle of, of that generation. But I grew up in Kentucky. Uh, I still regard myself as a Kentuckian. Uh, and, but then after I graduated from high school, I went east to school, uh, Princeton University and, and Harvard Law School. And so there was some period of time when you went from being a, uh, being a country bumpkin Red, <laughs> to, redneck. to being uh, a cosmopolitan. 
and having a real, uh, real passion for international affairs and world affairs. How, how did that happen? Well, first I would say I'm not sure it's correct that I developed a real passion for international affairs. I just became quite intrigued and interested in the issues. And um, there, at Princeton, I was in the, what was what's called the Woodrow Wilson School, my junior and senior years, and, and that very much introduced me to the issues. Uh, but, but after that, it was just a gradual um, uh, evolution. Uh, I decided at that point I wanted to do, I wanted to work in the international field, but that was a very broad concept and I didn't really know how I was going to be able to do that, but I wanted to do that. And over time, I, more and more, uh, I came to do that. And then, of course, when I joined the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in 1970, uh, well, at, at that point, I had graduated from law school. I'd served in the Army, and I'd held uh, about five or six different jobs in different uh, two law firms, several government agencies, law clerk. And I said to myself, well, uh, you've had six jobs in nine years. Uh, you ought to uh, probably stay for a while in this one. So I stayed 27 years uh, at the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in many different positions, but uh, still at the same agency. And I can honestly say, uh, I really can, that Every morning when I got up out of bed, had breakfast, and prepared myself to go to work, I just couldn't wait to get to the office to see what was going to happen that day. It was just really interesting. Even when I was the subject of rather vicious political attacks from um, uh, Jesse Helms and uh, the columnists Evans and Novak and uh, the Washington Times, some right-wing congressmen who, uh, uh, perhaps I could explain that later, why that happened, but they were, they were pretty, pretty rough, but uh, even that was interesting. So you were there during the Nixon administration when what many of us consider to be the third most important legal instrument of the 20th century entered into force. And that is uh, the first most important legal instrument would obviously be, in international affairs, would obviously be the UN Charter. Because without it, there wouldn't be a place for all the countries of the world to talk to each other. And the second would be the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which sets a norm of, of minimum human dignity for the peoples and governments of the world. But if you look, I mean, if you just think of all the written instruments that people have created, the, the power of those instruments. And the, many of us believe that the third most important legal instrument would be the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which came into force just as you entered government during the Nixon administration. That, that, that is correct. And, and let me explain why, at least in my opinion, that treaty is so important. Uh, as all of you know, uh, nuclear weapons were first developed during World War II and uh, after a few years, other nations began to acquire nuclear weapons after the United States did. Uh, United States, Soviet Union, uh, Britain, uh, France. Um, and in 1963, March of 1963, President John F. Kennedy, uh, in response to a reporter's question at a press um, interview, said that his greatest fear was that instead of four nuclear weapon states, by 1970 there would be 10. And by 1975, 18 or 20 with nuclear weapons integrated into their national arsenal. And he said, I would regard that as the greatest possible danger and hazard. He was convinced that nuclear weapons were destined to sweep all over the world. He tried to restrain the Israelis without success. Uh, the Chinese uh, came along with a bomb, not, 
many years later. And you have to remember the, the context. Um, Sweden had an ongoing nuclear weapon program. Switzerland twice voted by a national referendum to build nuclear weapons. It really did look like nuclear weapons might sweep all over the world, as President Kennedy fears, feared. And when the French in 1960, when they detonated their first weapon in the Sahara, banner headlines, vive la France, vive de Gaulle, and uh, great praise for the French government. Acquiring nuclear weapons was considered by everyone an act of national pride and national strength. But then the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty was negotiated. Countries began to realize that President Kennedy was right, that this had to be stopped. And so during the 1960s, this treaty was negotiated. And essentially what it did is it drew a line between those states that, that already had nuclear weapons, and by this time there were five, US, Soviet, uh, France, Britain, and China, and said, no more, uh, that's it. And uh, urged the, the countries of the world that didn't have nuclear weapons uh, to take the pledge. And um, many of them did at the beginning, and then over time, more and more and more did, uh, until today, uh, the entire world is part of the NPT with the five recognized nuclear weapon states. Everyone else has agreed never to have nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea withdrew from the treaty and Israel, Pakistan, and India um, never joined. That is far, far from President Kennedy's uh, nightmare. And the reason that the Nonproliferation Treaty could do that is that it converted what had been an act of national pride into an act of international outlawry. When India conducted their first nuclear test in 74, four years after the entry into force of the NPT, instead of being praised by the world like the French were in 1960, they were condemned by the entire world and they had to hastily say, well, this was a peaceful explosion, whatever that is. And so, undoubtedly, the world would have been like what President Kennedy uh, prophesied, and probably much worse, because it uh, wasn't long ago, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency said that probably 45 to 50 nuclear weapon states, uh, sorry, uh, the states of the world today could build nuclear weapons if they so chose. So just imagine a world where 45 to 50 countries have nuclear weapons integrated into their national arsenals. Venezuela has weapons. Cuba has weapons. Uh, many African countries have weapons. And you can be assured if nuclear weapons were that widely uh, distributed, uh, international terrorist organizations would have them as well. And 9-11 or some subsequent event like that would involve a nuclear explosion. The, as I recall, the treaty had within it a uh, provision that after 25 years, it would be reviewed to be determined whether it would be indefinitely extended, terminate, or be extended for a period of years. And I believe that you were involved in negotiating the indefinite extension of that treaty, which is now, uh, there are now 189 countries in it. As Ambassador Graham said, there's only four countries in the whole world out of the treaty. And you were one of the leaders of the delegation in 1995. Could you describe for us a little bit about 
about you know what was the flavor of these negotiations? What was the bargain? Was, I presume there was a bargain that the United States had to make uh, to get 189 countries to agree to do something. What was the bargain? How did it work? How did you negotiate that? Well, I, I essentially led U.S. government efforts to extend the, the NPT, and, and I don't think I'm exaggerating uh, when I say when I began that work, no one, I mean no one, thought it could be done because the non-aligned countries were against making it a permanent treaty because they wanted to keep the leverage of a time-limited treaty to use against the nuclear weapon states to force them to disarm. Uh, there was a bargain at the very beginning uh, in 1970, 1968, when it was signed, 1970. And the bargain was that in exchange for most of the world agreeing never to have the weapons, the nuclear weapon states, the five, would agree to uh, give them all uh, access to peaceful nuclear technology, nuclear power, and uh, would uh, pursue disarmament negotiations themselves to eventually eliminate their uh, nuclear weapons. And the, the non-nuclear states had a list of what some interim measures might be. They wanted to get them into the treaty, but were unsuccessful except they were, were able to get one in, and that's the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. But they regarded as, they, they recognized that elimin, eliminating nuclear weapons was a far off objective in the middle of the Cold War, but at least interim steps could be taken. Uh, a Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, stopping the testing, number one, Worldwide reductions in nuclear weapons, number two. Uh, a negotiation to eliminate the, the production of nuclear bomb material, fissile material, uh, and guarantees, legal guarantees that as non-nuclear weapon states, nuclear weapons would not be used against them. And uh, so that was the sort of core of it. And then in 1995, when we extended the treaty and made it permanent, by consensus, um, we repackaged those original commitments with an agreement to have a test ban in one year and, and these other, other uh, commitments that I just mentioned, plus a number of others, such as a, uh, more nuclear weapon free zones, more agreements to uh, make nuclear weapons off limits to certain regions, including the Middle East, and uh, better verification for uh, the NPT, um, something called the 93 plus 2 process, which became the rather well-known additional protocol, which requires NPT, NPT states to uh, permit much more inspection of their countries. Um, so we, we had to uh, repackage that and, and, and bargain for permanent extension uh, that way. But in addition, uh, it, it required a lot of really just personal diplomacy. Uh, I mean, I, I, it was expected when I took the job in late 93 that I would be essentially working through conferences, uh, uh, disarmament conferences and so forth to try to persuade countries to go along with making the treaty permanent. But I decided that that really was, just wasn't going to work. Um, dis most disarmament conferences are essentially uh, old, boy, old boy clubs, or I should say old boy and girl clubs now, um, and often are not representative of their governments. So I decided to go to capitals and make my case all over the world. And so in the next like two and a half years or so, I went to 54 countries, some of them many times. So I went to Egypt seven times. Egypt was the big problem. Um, and most of the time, um, 
it, uh, it the, deci the, the conversations were on the subject of the NPT. Uh, uh, yes, we agree that the non-proliferation treaty is important, but what about these commitments like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty? Other conversations, like the ones I had in Latin America, I went to almost every Latin American state, and I usually met with either the foreign minister or the deputy foreign minister, and the conversation was always the same. It was, yes, we agree with you on the NPT. It's important. It's important to make this treaty permanent so it will never be questioned again. Now, let's talk about what's of direct concern to us, and that's the avalanche of guns that's coming from your country into my country into the hands of the drug gangs. That was what I heard all over Latin America. This was 94, 95. Um, and, but then sometimes it wasn't even like that. Uh, Jamaica said, well, yes, we'll, we'll go along with you, but can you do something about raising the price of bananas? And, <laughs> and, and so there was quite a variety in, in the discussions, but over time we did persuade just about everybody to uh, support making this vital treaty permanent and, and put it in a condition where it could no longer be challenged, no longer be threatened uh, with, with elimination. And it, it, in my opinion, I certainly agree with what uh, Jonathan said, it's the bedrock of international security. But it's really important that we keep it viable and strong, and that means the United States has got to approve the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. We have to proceed ahead with widespread and much deeper nuclear weapon reductions. We have to give legally binding guarantees that other states won't, will never be attacked with nuclear weapons. And we have to find a way to get the negotiations on eliminating uh, nuclear bomb material uh, uh, eliminating the production of nuclear bomb material and, and some of these other issues. Uh, the NPT is not a gift uh, to the nuclear weapon states from the rest of the world. Uh, they didn't agree never to have nuclear weapons because they think we're nice guys. Uh, they did it as part of a strategic bargain and it's important for us to recognize our half of this bargain our half, the nuclear weapon state half, if we expect this treaty to hold together over the long term. One of the, one of the points that you mentioned in the bargaining was nuclear weapons free zones. And um, you know, most Americans don't know that, and these are such mellifluous sounding treaties, that <laughs> the Treaty of Tlatelolco mm. makes mm. all of Latin mm. America a nuclear Jonathan weapons free. Tlatelolco. <laughs> right. The treaty making all of Latin America nuclear weapons free. The treaty of Raratango making the South Pacific nuclear weapons free. The treaty of Pelindabra making Africa nuclear weapons free. And now there's a treaty uh, making Central Asia nuclear weapons free. And Mongolia has declared itself a nuclear weapons free zone. Virtually the entire southern hemisphere of the planet is nuclear weapons free? The northern hemisphere is not. Um, and I wondered, because people don't realize how important these, this, the, these issues are. Last December, I had the privilege of being in Hiroshima and speaking at the summit of the Nobel Peace Laureates. And Hiroshima is it's a, it's a very powerful experience. Uh, uh, I, I, I've only had the same experience as I had at the test site in Semipolitensk where the Soviet Union tested 496 weapons uh, and caused over a million and a half uh, medical problems for the people of Kazakhstan, according to their president told us, a million and a half birth defects, leukemias, horrible, horrible things. And the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were 12 to 15 kilotons, 12,000 to 15,000 tons of TNT equivalent. And there were tests that Ambassador Graham told me at Semipolitansk in the range of 58 megatons. A megaton 
is equivalent to a million tons of TNT. 12,000 tons to 58 million tons equivalent. I wondered if you could talk about what does a nuclear weapon do and why should we care about it? Why should everybody care about it? Well, the first thing to understand about nuclear weapons is that they're not weapons of war such as we have always known. Uh, they're not like TNT. They're not like uh, bombs dropped from airplanes. They're not like tanks and artillery. They are qualitatively different. Enough of them can destroy the world. Uh, and they, they uh, through the release of uh, nuclear fission, can uh, cause enormous explosions. Um, the bomb that was used on, on Hiroshima was, was uh, 12.6 kilotons. One kiloton is a thousand tons of TNT explosive equivalent. That bomb killed um, he, promptly 200,000 people and another, um, another uh, 80,000 died subsequently from radio radi radiation poisoning. So 280,000 people out of a total population of 330,000. Uh, that's, that's pretty devastating. Um, but that was, that was a very small bomb uh, and, and was the first one used. And uh, I should mention here that there's two ways to make a nuclear bomb. One is uh, the, the gun type weapon, which is what Hiroshima was. If, if we had highly enriched uranium, if Jonathan had brought in a, a bag full of highly enriched uranium, <laughs> uh, three or four of us together could, could make one of those. They're, they're, and could, we could make our own Hiroshima right here. It, it's very simple. All you need is a long tube, preferably titanium, 10 feet long, and you put, if you want to overcompensate, you put 20 to 25 pounds of each highly enriched uranium at one end, and you put 20 to 25 pounds of highly enriched uranium at the other end, and you put plastic explosives behind the highly enriched uranium and shoot it down the tube, and when they can collide, you get 12.6 kilotons. That's all there is to it. It's really simple. But the problem with that type of nuclear weapon technology is it can't be miniaturized. It's heavy and bulky and it's suitable to drop out of an airplane, but, but not to put on the end of a missile. The other way to make nuclear weapons is the so-called implosion method, which is technically much more challenging. You have a, you have a sphere, the concept of a sphere, and you put a small amount of highly enriched uranium or plutonium in a, uh, called a pit in the, in the center of this sphere. And then you surround it with plastic explosives. And you design those plastic explosives to all explode inward simultaneously and crush the core. And, that, and that's how you get some very large nuclear explosions. Now, atomic weapons, that is based solely on the fission process, the uranium-235, uh, highly enriched uranium. The upper limit uh, of those weapons, uh, if you do what they call boosting, um, the upper limit of those weapons is about 500 kilotons. But in the late 40s, tested first in 1950, is what became known as the hydrogen bomb, the uh, thermonuclear bomb, which is, involves the, instead of the splitting of atoms, the fusing of hydrogen atoms, releasing truly enormous amounts of uh, explosive power. Those weapons are triggered by a nuclear atomic weapon and which creates a sufficient level of heat 
to create th the thermonuclear weapon. And essentially, those weapons have no limit. They can be made to any level of, of explosive power. Um, the 58.6 megaton test that the Soviets did, that Jonathan alluded to, that bomb was designed to be 100 megatons, but they scaled it down um, to protect the pilot that dropped it. And I think in, in understanding what nuclear weapons really are, um, you need to think of, uh, you need to have an understanding of what, a, you know, kiloton, megaton, what does that mean? Well, a megaton is one million tons of nuclear explosive equivalent. One million metric tons of nuclear explosive equivalent. Roughly speaking, think of a freight train that's loaded with high explosives, TNT. Long freight train loaded with high explosives. And that freight train stretches from New York, it's so long, New York to Los Angeles. And that's about one megaton all of that. And if a one megaton device was dropped on Philadelphia, it would probably, probably destroy everything out to about 10 or 15 miles, and I, I, in every direction, um, if it was an air burst. And I mean really destroy, not just uh, slightly damage. Um, and I mean these are immensely incredibly destructive weapons. And as I said, you know, get a few mad scientists together, you can make a thermonuclear bomb at any, of any size. You could make it a, a million megatons, a million million metric tons. I mean, you just keep adding sections to it, that's all. Uh, so this is, tech, this is technology that directly threatens the survival of the world and has to be controlled. It must be controlled if our generation and future generations are going to be safe. And it's been very difficult to control because it's all wrapped up in military concepts and national pride and great power status and all of this kind of thing. And Somehow, as a world community, we have to find a way to get past that. One of the uh, most, one of the most, uh, the, it, it boggles the imagination that within one one thousandth of a second, it would be three times the heat of the face of the sun. You simply can't, the mind can't grasp the destructive capacity. And one of the most impactful stories that you ever told me, Ambassador Graham, was when you went to South Africa. And, uh, and they showed you what they had done. If you, could, if you could share that with us, I think that's, it really tells so much about where we are in history. Well, I, I went to South Africa, well, when I was doing the extension of the non-proliferation treaties, I mentioned I went to capitals to plead my case. And I went to South Africa, and of course, they had had a program uh, which they uh, abandoned uh, and then joined the NPT. And so I spent the first day there, my assistant and I, um, uh, talking with people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then the second day, the atomic energy people took us out to see the facilities. And they took us to the place where they made the highly enriched uranium, which was closed, this beautiful plant. And then they took us to Pelandaba, which is the name of the treaty, where they actually assembled the nuclear weapons. And uh, they took us to the room where they, in the building, uh, where they assembled the weapons. And they said, look around you. Nothing's changed. And there wasn't anything in that room you wouldn't find in a high school mach machine shop. And then um, they took us to the uh, place uh, nearby where the, um, the weapons were stored. Um, and we, they would store them, they would sort of 
store them in two pieces, but, but we could see uh, from these storage bins what the size of the completed weapon was, assembled weapon was. And it would have easily fit in the back of a panel truck. It's heavy, but it, it certainly um, would have fit in a, in a panel truck. It was a gun type weapon that they developed, which I described earlier. Um, and it was, uh, it was um, designed for 20 kilotons, which was the size of the bomb that destroyed um, uh, Nagasaki. 20 kilotons can do a lot of damage. And then they said to us, the atomic energy officials, they said that you're the first Americans to see this, except for the two that were on the International uh, Atomic Energy Inspection Team when we gave up the weapons. And we're showing you this for a reason. We, we only spent about $25 million. Uh, only 150 people were involved. We made six weapons and we had a seventh uh, under construction. Almost, and if you use the gun type technology, almost any country can do this if they can acquire the highly enriched uranium. Almost any country, and probably subnational groups as well. It's not that difficult. Actually, it's quite easy. So you don't need a big infrastructure like Iraq had. So be aware. That's, uh, that's really quite frightening uh, that, that here was a relatively small country uh, could actually, with six weapons, you could pretty much take out uh, a big part of civilization, actually. I know that I've seen studies that if India and Pakistan, which only have about 300 seconds to decide whether there's a computer hack that looks like an attack or not, were to use their weapons that it would cause enough uh, climate change on the planet to render civilization uh, uninhabitable. And so I, I, I wondered if you could talk about the experience uh, within, the, within the United States, within our internal debate, when you were negotiating, to, when you were advocating within the United States to get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which you had promised on behalf of the United States as part of the bargain for the extension of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the internal debates, and then the process of representing the United States to convince the rest of the world to sign on to the treaty. And then maybe we could talk about where we are today with that treaty. Okay. Well, it was very interesting. Um, I'm going to be uh, talk about process a little bit, so I hope it's not, not, not too boring. Uh, but in 1992, the Congress passed a law called the Hatfield-Mitchell-Exxon Law, which required the United States to enter a nine-month moratorium on nuclear weapon tests. And we hadn't done a test in a couple of years. And, and after that, we could do five tests a year for three years. Uh, and then, um, and then we had, then then we were to stop, and um, um, uh, negotiate. Uh, we were to stop and, and and continue a moratorium afterwards, until a comprehensive test ban treaty was in place, and we should uh, attempt to negotiate the comprehensive test ban treaty. That was the congressional law that was passed. Uh, um, George H.W. Bush, President George H.W. Bush, wanted to veto it, but it was attached to the super collider part of the DOE Department of Energy bill, and he considered that important to his reelection, so he signed it. Um, and um, so, by the spring of 93, when I was the acting uh, director of, of the uh, arms control agency, 
um, the moratorium was going to come to an end. And so the U.S. government had to decide, were we going to do the five tests? Were we going to pursue a nuclear, a, a comprehensive test ban treaty? Um, or, or would we just continue the moratorium indefinitely? And there was a caveat on the, on the bill that passed the Congress was that this whole system only whole arrangement only holds as long as no other nation tests. It's the language. No other nation tests. So what followed was a huge intra-U.S. government battle over whether or not to do the five tests. That was the big thing. It was generally accepted that we would at least go through the motions of trying to negotiate a comprehensive test ban treaty, although be difficult to achieve one in the middle of carrying out these tests for three years. But the problem was, of the five tests, three of them were for safety improvements that the Pentagon didn't want. Uh, a fourth one was to test for reliability, which we never did. And the fifth one was for the British. And so, uh, it wasn't too hard to make, I mean, at least logically, it wasn't too hard uh, to make an argument that why should we do these tests? The Pentagon doesn't want the results. We don't do them for reliability in the British, and we're going we're gonna to do things just because the British want them. Um, so, but of course, they, it wasn't that. They wanted to do the tests, and they'd, do other, they'd get other benefits from the tests. So it went up to the National Security Council. We had two meetings, and the, the, the composition of the meeting was uh, Secretary Christopher, Secretary of State Warren Christopher, Secretary of Defense Les Aspen, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Colin Powell, uh, James Woolsey, Jim Woolsey, the Director of CIA, who didn't have a vote. He could just talk about the intelligence. Hazel O'Leary, the Secretary of Energy, uh, uh, the White House Science Advisor, uh, and myself. And so, at the, I, I won't uh, go through all the details, but at the first meeting, uh, Christopher and Aspen said, we want to do the five tests, that was the deal. And Powell said, well, nuclear weapons are, are the crown jewels, so I want to do the tests. And then the National Security Advisor, Tony Lake, said, well, who will argue against doing the tests and extending the moratorium permanently uh, until we have a comprehensive test ban treaty? So I made that argument, saying that how could we have a permanent NPT, which was coming up in two years, if we were in the middle of a test program? And how could we persuade Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus to give up their weapons in the wake of the Cold War, which were left on their territory, if we loved nuclear weapons so much we were doing these tests? And um, Jack Gibbons, the science advisor, appointed me, uh, supported me, and, and Hazel O'Leary said, uh, I'm new here, I just got confirmed, uh, I can't make a decision now. And so very reluctantly, the uh, meeting was put off for two weeks, and in the meantime, I had a chance to talk with Hazel, and she said, I'm gonna go for the moratorium, not for doing the tests. And so at the next meeting, that's what happened. We split, 3-3. Three, three. Um, uh, Powell, Christopher, and Aspen on one side, and Hazel O'Leary, <coughs> Jack Gibbons, and myself on the other side. Although General Powell, showed some uncertainty when he said, well, he said, I'm a military man. I, I, will, I use nuclear weapons. I don't test them. That's the Department of Energy's responsibility. So he got a little bit up on the fence. But anyway, it was a 3-3 split, went to the president, um, and Clinton, after consulting with key members of the Congress, decided to support our side. And, but remember, it was all subject to this 
caveat. This only works. The U.S. only stops nuclear weapon testing forever uh, pursuant to this moratorium and pursues a test ban uh, if no other nation tests. This happened in early June, after five months of debate. Uh, by late August, it was absolutely clear the Chinese were going to do a test for the first time in three years. The French were te weren't testing because they were following a moratorium. The Russians weren't testing because they were following a moratorium. The British couldn't test because they used our test site. Um, so it was only the Chinese, and it looked like uh, they were going to uh, test. Now it looked like it was clear they were going to test. And those of us that had advocated the, in the permanent extension of the moratorium against doing nuclear tests and terminating the U.S. nuclear weapon test program, <coughs> going into a test ban. Um, we were very fearful that the whole thing would be overturned. So we had a, we had a third National Security Council meeting on this subject. This time it was in the Situation Room of the White House. First two had been in the Cabinet Room, which is a nice big room. The Situation Room is a really small room and everybody's kind of sitting elbow to elbow. And I was sitting right between the Science Advisor and General Powell. And um, so the National Security Advisor says, all right, we're here together. Uh, we all know why we're here. Uh, there was this caveat that we all agreed to, that everything goes away, our moratorium policy goes away, it all, it all goes away, and we do the tests if another nation tests. And it looks like China is going to test. Jim Woolsey, the CIA director, give us the intelligence. So Woolsey laid it out. I mean, it was unmistakable. They had the tower up and everything. So it was clear they were going to test in a week or two. So now this is your government at work. This is how government really works, as opposed to what uh, the West Wing says and, and other TV shows. This is how it really works. Uh, so uh, Tony Lake says, uh, well, it's clear the Chinese are going to test. Does that mean everything's off the table? Does that mean the end of our policy? And the Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, raises his hand and he says, he says, well, he says, we're Americans. I don't think our policy should be dictated to us by what some, some guys over in Beijing are doing. And everybody else said, that's right. <laughs> that was the end of the meeting. <laughs> that's how things really happen. Uh, and so then that meant the U.S. was, we were still following that moratorium, by the way, in 2011 uh, from 1993. How many years is that? 18 years. Um, and so that meant the U.S. basically permanently gave up testing and pursued a, uh, a comprehensive test ban treaty in Geneva. And as, as we, and then when we got to the NPT negotiations, we pledged to finish that in one year. The biggest problem was India. Um, India, you know, always talked a good game, but when it really came to having a test ban, they didn't want to have any part of it, and they tried to block the decision in Geneva, which is supposed to be by consensus. And so we, we decided that the only way to get this was to circumvent the disarmament negotiations in, in, um, in uh, Geneva and go directly to the United Nations. The treaty was all worked out. It was just that India was blocking it. And just have somebody introduce the treaty in New York. And then we could vote on it as to whether or not countries should sign it. And so there was this, traditionally there was this troika, they were called, three nations that offered a test ban resolution every year. 
Australia, New Zealand, and Mexico. So we asked the three of them, will you do this for us? Will you introduce the test ban in New York? And Mexico said, no, we're not getting into that. And New Zealand said the same thing. Only Australia had the courage to do it. And they said, we'll do it. And so Australia introduced the, the, the treaty as a UN resolution. And there was a vote on it. It was 158 to three uh, favoring the treaty. The three were India, Bhutan, uh, controlled by India, and Iraq. And so we were happily telling the Indians that uh, it's good to see who your real friend is, Saddam Hussein. And, and so that's how the treaty got signed. And then uh, uh, it, well, I won't recount the subsequent history, but the main thing that happened was it went to the U.S. Senate in 1999 and was rejected uh, by the U.S. Senate, um, uh, largely by uh, Republican senators, um, for various reasons, but I, I believe that the principal reason was they just wanted to take a shot at President Clinton. Uh, also, it, it maybe wasn't handled in the best best possible way, but that's where we are now. Uh, but that's your next question, Jonathan. Well, I find it interesting that you were, you were a diplomat for us when we obtained the Biological Weapons Convention, which was led by Richard Nixon, a Republican. The Chemical Weapons Convention, which was negotiated under uh, Bush Sr., a Republican. The INF Treaty, uh, Start One, which were initiated by President Reagan. And um, so that this idea of partisanship in arms control, at least during the Cold War, was clearly overcome. And I wondered if you could talk about uh, where we are now with the Test Ban Treaty, why it's important, and, and how to overcome this partisanship uh, issue on it. Well, it's really interesting that you bring up the, uh, uh, the partisan side of it. Um, only two, if I remember correctly, only two treaties have been, um, have been successfully signed and ratified. Two arms control disarmament treaties have been signed and ratified successfully by a Democratic president. Uh, first one was the Limited Test Ban Treaty in 1962. President Kennedy, and, and of course he had a Democratic Senate to ratify it. And then President Obama recently, with the New START Treaty, um, had a, he, um, he signed it, and he, he had also had a Democratic Senate, but a much more toxic uh, atmosphere. All the other ones were negotiated by Republicans. Um, um, and, and I mean, su the ones that were successfully signed and, and ratified. And um, no, no American president has ever completed more than one arms control um, and disarmament treaty, with one exception. No president. Kennedy, Johnson, Ford, Reagan, Clinton. None of them did more than one. George H.W. Bush mm -hmm. did four. And he is overwhelmingly yeah. the most successful arms control uh, president. He's a Republican. The best, just from my own experience, for what it's worth, now I'm, I recognize the Republican Party is not what it used to be. Um, it used to be a, a, a moderately, it used to be a conservative party dominated by moderates. Well, it's not that anymore. But in any case, 
putting that aside for the moment, the best combination over the years, overwhelmingly the best com combination, was to have a Republican negotiate the treaty and have a Democratic Senate approve it. That was, that was, the, that was the, the way it best worked. Um, even then it was not free from difficulty, but um, that, was, that was best. Now, what that will mean for the future, I don't know. I mean, the Repu as I said, we don't have the Republican Party that we used to have. We have something that's, I don't know how to describe it, but it's very different from, from what we had. M much of the debate now seems to be driven by a sort of crisis du jour, I call it. And uh, one of the crisis du jour that we heard last week was that there's a breakdown between the United States and Russia over missile defense, which we need to protect ourselves against Iran. And, uh, and it, instead of staying on course that you described of moving toward lowering the threat, creating stable treaties, moving toward elimination, I wondered if you could talk about, I mean, the logic of it, given the success of these treaties, given the steps that you laid out, cutting off the production of more nuclear weapons material, a fissile material cutoff treaty, stopping other countries from testing that could miniaturize their weapons, that could join the club, a strengthening, strengthening the inspection regime. All of these things obviously make us safer. The logic of, uh, with America's conventional superiority, the logic of a nuclear weapons free world being so much more secure, What's the problem, Ambassador Graham? I mean, why, why we, we have a history of Republicans making progress on it. Why are we in this jam and how do we get out of it? What can people do? Which jam precisely? Are the you jam of to? the debate not focusing on that which makes us safer and focusing on uh, uh, every, every season a new crisis. Well, North Korea being, is hardly the existential threat that the Soviet Union posed. Iran, uh, Iran, uh, uh, Iran is, is certainly not uh, comparable to the kind of threat that the Soviet Union posed, and yet we're putting so much uh, on these issues. Well, I'm going to give a multiple answer to that question. Uh, the simple, uh, I'll start with saying I really don't know. I'm not sure uh, why we are in the situation we are. But among the factors that one should consider in, in analyzing this situation is number one, missile defense doesn't work, it never has worked, and it never will work. It's, it can't. Uh, it's just not technically possible to intercept a missile with a missile, uh, unless maybe you use nuclear weapons uh, and uh, on the defensive missile and even then, probably not. It's just too easy to add uh, decoys and other similar devices that just make it impossible to pick up the real warhead coming, coming in, if it's a modern missile, coming in at 7,000 kilometers uh, a minute or something like that. Uh, it, it's, it's coming in with tremendous velocity and it's not, it's just doesn't and can't work. Uh, it, it, um, it's always been a waste of money. It's always been based on politics. It's always been based on, on, on you know, jobs for the military industrial complex, jobs and money. It was no accident that the missile defense program located at, at least the production of one of the components and as many possible congressional districts as they could. Um, the, the outgoing commander of our strategic forces, General Gene Habacher, in, in 2005 <clears throat> made a public statement in which he said that missile defense as a program has moved from technology to theology. Uh, that, that's what the military thinks about it. Um, and a former Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry, once said 
that you can never, the military likes to have weapons that they can test under battlefield conditions. You can't do that with missile defense. Even if you, you know, have some of these tests that seem to work, is a president still ready to risk Los Angeles uh, uh, to, to fend off North Korea? Pro probably not. Pro if, if North Korea says, you know, we've got half a dozen missiles that can reach the United States and will destroy Los Angeles if you do X, uh, I submit that no president, no chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is going to do X under that condition, uh, relying on missile defense to defend Los Angeles, because you, you have to have 100% confidence, and, and we'll never have that. So we start with that, and then uh, defending against Iranian missiles, um, well, uh, they, someday probably Iran will have nuclear weapons and a missile that can reach the United States or a missile that can reach Europe, which is compatible with those weapons, but they certainly don't have it now. And who knows, maybe they'll never have it, but whatever they build is, is not going to work uh, and, and be able to stop Iranian missiles. On the other hand, the Russians have always had this neuralgic view of U.S. Uh, missile defense uh, that somehow, some way, those technologically oriented Americans will figure out a way to degrade our systems if it's used against us. And therefore, this Iranian ploy you're advancing is just a big fake. You're really trying to, to suppress our weapons so that you'll have strategic superiority over Russia and be able to push us around as much as you want. That's been a factor in U.S.-Russian, U.S.-Soviet and U.S.-Russian uh, non-proliferation, uh, not non-proliferation, arms control, disarmament uh, negotiations for the last 25 years. There's nothing new about it. It's very old. And why do we get totally caught up with with uh, the North Korean and Iranian crises, well, they're, they're driven by certain political in, um, interests and, and hugely hyped by the media. That's not to say they're not dangerous. They're plenty dangerous, but uh, they shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be permitted to, to take over the entire agenda. I remain concerned by the fact that we have 20,000 nuclear weapons still in the world today. That is a reality that, that I hope that we could get more people concerned about rather than countries that might develop the weapons. There are, there are as we speak, thousands of warheads pointed at us from, uh, from Russia right today, and we're pointing them at them. And Jonathan, of those 20,000, Weapons, at least uh, seventeen thousand, at least uh, at least thirteen thousand are Russian. The U.S. has only five. Russia has twelve or thirteen, and the re rest of the world makes up the remainder. So that's where the game is. All those Russian weapons. I'd like to open up uh, to the floor to some questions and comments from people. Well, it's not like, not like our class. <laughs> what kind of teeth will the treaties have uh, in them to implement their, implement their uh, policies? Well, no arms control treaty has teeth in it like a domestic law does because uh, we don't live in a, in, a, in a, we don't have a world government and we don't have, there, there isn't a court that can order Russia to comply. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, these, these treaties have very extensive verification systems, including on-site inspection, which give us enough warning that if the obligations are not adhered to, and if uh, Russia or whoever uh, breaks out of the treaty, we'll have time 
we'll know far enough in advance that 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 they're breaking out of the treaty in order to build weapons or something like that to be able to mount a response, a policy response. In addition, uh, the country in question will be um, undoubtedly referred to the Security Council of the United Nations for consideration of Chapter 7 sanctions uh, imposed by the Security Council. That's essentially it. Chapter 7 is what permits the use of force against them. So that if the United States and Russia decided to do something uh, to come down in their number of weapons and somebody broke out of that, it's pretty clear that the use of force would be invoked. And one of the issues of the START Treaty was, and we heard the debate was without it, we wouldn't have that inspection regime. That's why it's so important. As Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. And Ambassador Graham helped negotiate, what was it, a 300-page document on the verification under the first START Treaty? No, oh, yeah, at least. It was 300 maybe, pages maybe of protocols longer. for those, for the, for the way in which we made ourselves safe in that treaty. <coughs> yes, please. So, following along with that discussion, so how does that really help us, you know, the, the issue of Chapter 7 and, and uh, the United Nations, how does that really help us with rogue nation, Iran, Well, with respect to Iran and North Korea and similar countries, uh, if a country decides that their national security requires them to have nuclear weapons, historically there's been no way to stop them. You, you can't stop them, uh, short of invasion. Um, and uh, I think that in the North Korean, I hope this doesn't sound partisan, it's not intended that way. Um, North Korea was prepared to make a settlement with us in the year 2000. They were willing to uh, permanently terminate their plutonium <coughs> weapon program, not start up their uranium nuclear weapon program, uh, eliminate all their missiles, uh, provide the U.S. with extensive um, on-site inspection, and at least discuss a long-term peace treaty. And uh, that's what President Clinton had negotiated. Uh, but it wasn't finished. It wasn't, it was, but it was almost finished. And uh, General Powell, who was the incoming Secretary of State, wanted to carry that through to completion. But uh, President uh, George W. Bush decided to dispense with the whole thing on the grounds that uh, we don't negotiate with evil, we destroy it. So we lost the opportunity to stop North Korea. You can't stop them now, probably, I don't think. Uh, maybe there's some way to bring them back into the fold, but they've got 10 or 12 weapons now, and they've got missiles that another test would demonstrate could carry those weapons. So I'm not sure that the situation there is salvageable. Maybe, maybe, maybe under some kind of broad-gauged uh, commitment with us, they only care about us, no, nobody else in terms of a negotiating partner. Maybe um, there can be some kind of deal where they give up these weapons. I think it's highly unlikely now, but um, uh, it could have happened. Uh, second, with Iran, um, in, in my opinion, the Iranians have at least four reasons for wanting to have nuclear weapons. First, it will permit them to more 
significantly dominate their region just by the prestige of having nuclear weapons. Uh, second, uh, they probably think that it'll be less likely that the United States will attack them. They're uh, a, a, an elected member of the Axis of Evil Club, and uh, they have, I'm sure, noted, as have the North Koreans, that the only one of their, their fellow members that was attacked by the United States was the one that didn't have nuclear weapons. Um, third, um, they're very, very concerned, the Iranians are, with the Pakistani uh, nuclear weapons stockpile. Uh, they've said so publicly on a number of occasions that they're concerned that a radical Sunni regime will come to power in uh, Pakistan and use those nuclear weapons against Iran, which is a Shia country. So uh, they think they need to have weapons for that reason, because of Pakistan. And lastly, um, they, many Iranians believe, uh, appear to believe, that uh, Persia used to be uh, the greatest, the world's greatest power. Um, the Persian Empire was the world's strongest. Um, some of its former provinces now have nuclear weapons. Iran deserves to be a great power. Since the beginning of the Cold War, to a large degree, having or not having nuclear weapons determined whether or not you were regarded as a great power. Therefore, they want the weapons, so they'll be considered a great power. That's, that's sort of a difficult agenda to turn off. The only way it might be turned off is that it's very clear that if Iran builds nuclear weapons, that Saudi Arabia is going to acquire nuclear weapons. They have said so publicly and privately all over the world, everywhere. And they don't have to build nuclear weapons, in my opinion. They finance the Pakistani program. And I've always believed that of the now 110 nuclear weapons in Pakistan, there's about 10 that have this legend on the side of the weapon property of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, the deal is Pakistan will ship them over if they really have to have them. I, I think that's just indisputable, personally. Uh, and other countries, um, Egypt, Syria, Turkey, might go for nuclear weapons and if confronted with an Iranian nuclear weapon stockpile. That can't be in their interest. It just can't. So as a result, I think that there's a chance, probably a good chance, that they won't go all the way, that they will develop their capability right up to the point where they could build nuclear weapons quickly, but uh, not actually build them, like Japan has done. Japan could build nuclear weapons in a, in a month or so, several hundred of them. And that's where I think probably Iran is aiming. Now, that's not good enough for Israel, uh, so who knows what they'll do. But if they, they should attack Iran, you can bet your bottom dollar that Iran will build nucle nuclear weapons and the attack won't make any difference. Uh, the, in order to really stop that program, I've been advised by senior military officers who I think know what they're talking about, that that would require, at, at a minimum, 30 days of continuous bombing all over the country. Now, Israel can't do that, and the U.S. wouldn't. So, I think we have to be prepared for at least nuclear weapon capability in the hands of the Iranians. Sanctions will never work. 
The only other possibility to stop them short of that would be to have what used to be called a, a grand bargain with Iran, which they actually offered to us in 2003 after our invasion of Iraq because they were scared they were next. Um, but that was uh, rejected by the Bush White House, again, even though Powell wanted to follow it up. But that, that proposal would have, I mean, if it was real, well, we'll never know. But if it was real, it would have solved everything. I mean, they proposed to stop su stopping supporting Hezbollah, stop supporting uh, Islamic Jihad and Hamas, recognize the state of Israel, uh, uh, adopt the Abdullah's two-state plan, uh, <clears throat> uh, open up their nuclear laboratories to American inspectors and allow us to participate in their program as long as they could keep it, support a, uh, a um, secular democratic uh, uh, state in Iraq, and uh, turn over to us all the Al-Qaeda prisoners they had, uh, in exchange for which they wanted us to turn over to them these uh, <clears throat> uh, Mujahideen uh, former terrorists that had been in operating in Iran and subsequently defected to Saddam Hussein, a recognition of their right to advanced technology, um, a, um, uh, at least the opportunity to seek reparations from Iraq for the Iraq-Iran war, and uh, respect, as they put it. Um, so that might have been solved uh, uh, at that time. Maybe somehow that concept can be resuscitated. Uh, again, I doubt it. It's been eight years since we rejected that, but maybe. I think more likely, uh, it's going to be nuclear weapon capability in Iran and nuclear weapons in, in North Korea, and we'll just have to find a way not just to live with that, but maybe somehow work it out so that it's less dangerous than it is. Yes, please. Um, I've got kind of an ill-informed question. I've always kind of wondered about it. Can I get the microphone so we can hear you. Okay. Um, you're the first you would know the answer. The question is, um, in regard to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, whether it's really worth going after uh, full bore at this time. It's really worth going after We've already got a moratorium in place, and maybe the, the, the way to have our energies directed would be directly going for abolition of nuclear weapons. In other words, is, is it... Well, is let me see if I understand the question. The question is, is it really worth pursuing the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty as opposed to putting that aside and going great, great directly to the abolition of nuclear weapons? Is that the question? More or less, yes. More or less. <laughs> Close enough for government work, right? <laughs> um, well, um, some may not like this answer, but I'm, I'm going to give it. Anyway, um, abolition of nuclear weapons is way off in the future. It's not going to happen anytime soon. It can't. It's, it, 2030 is the earliest, earliest where, where anything really significant could happen. I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare for it. Not, I'm a member of Global Zero and among other things. Uh, and we should work in that direction, but even Global Zero doesn't think it will happen before 2030. Uh, and probably it may not happen then. It may never happen. But the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is essential to the long-term viability of the NPT. States all over the world have made that clear. Uh, this is, we, look, we didn't do you guys a favor. We made a strategic bargain and you, if you're not going to live up to it, then we're not going to live up to our part. We just can't let the NPT fall apart. We just can't. We'll live in a world that will make today's world seem like paradise. 
And so we just have to ratify this. If we want to be secure, we have to ratify the test ban. And of course, naturally, like all these things, it creates a huge U.S. advantage because we've had, we've had more tests than the rest of the world combined. We have the most advanced technology that can function better, best in a non-testing environment. Um, it will hurt the programs in other countries much more than ours. But never, nevertheless, the most cogent region, uh, reason is, is the NPT. And um, uh, I, I just don't think that, I don't think the NPT will last long enough without the test ban to get us to abolition. And what will happen is that we'll end up in around 20, uh, 20, 2025 with President Kennedy's uh, nightmare becoming a reality and then it'll be even more difficult to eliminate nuclear weapons. Yes, sir, please. I, I agree with you, Professor, that uh, of great concern today are those weapons that exist right now, uh, particularly the ones in Russia that, uh, that are still pointed at us. And uh, I know during my lifetime there have uh, been several different, let's say, brands of government in, in Russia and the old Soviet Union. I'd like to know how uh, the methods with which you've uh, had to negotiate treaties have evolved over the years in, in response to their uh, different styles of government over there. How the methods of negotiating treaties have with changed the Russians. Hmm? With, with the Russians, Russians right. have changed to reflect the differences in the, the world geopolitical situation. Right. Well, I can tell you one difference. Uh, it took, and, I, and I, I can speak from personal painful experience. Uh, the the SALT II treaty took seven years to negotiate. Uh, the, the Stark I treaty took 10 years to negotiate. The new Stark treaty took one year to negotiate. Uh, that's one big difference. Uh, negotiating with Russia is much more like negotiating with a, a normal country. Negotiating with the Soviet Union was a very, very slow, tedious process. Um, and, and I think there's a lot more of um, trying to understand and accommodate each other uh, than, than in the past. And uh, I think that perhaps we understand each other a little bit better. But there still are Russian national interests, like the missile defense, which we were discussing earlier, that, that don't change. And uh, we, that's something we need to, I mean, I realize it's politics and it's hard to do, but if possible, we should try to, to um, recognize and understand and modify our behavior to so as to accommodate that. Uh, I, I mean, it can be done. It's not, I, I won't say it's easy, but it can be done. Well, a few closing remarks before we, we, we wrap this up. Um, one, of the, one of the points the Secretary General of the United Nations has recently made is the need for a treaty banning nuclear weapons in the same way as the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Biological Weapons Convention. Not as something that'll happen today, but as a compass point to give clarity to where we're going and to be able to evaluate policies, whether they go in that direction or not. That's why the Secretary General has pushed that and the President of our country has now called for moving in that direction when he chaired the Security Council in 2009 and when they brought 44 heads of state to Washington for his nuclear security summit. And Ronald Reagan, of course, said in Reykjavik, a nuclear, well, in Geneva, a nuclear weapons war can never be won, must never be fought, and then called for abolition with Gorbachev, and they came this close. It was missile defense that stopped it. And um, Ma Ma Secretary McNamara made an amazing point at the UN at a, on a panel that 
Ambassador Graham was on, in which he said, nuclear weapons are suicidal to use against a country that has them, patently immoral and illegal against a country that doesn't have them, and have no use against terrorists. So from a military point of view, they're not usable, as General Habinger said. So moving in that direction in many ways creates a, a, a lowered political currency for the weapons. The big problem with Iran, I must say, I, I had dinner about a month ago with the foreign minister of Iran, and they harp on the nuclear non-proliferation treaties, peaceful uses of technology that's given to them. The problem, the problem is they still feel isolated and they do want to strike a bargain. I, can, I, I know that. They are looking to strike a bargain. But they want to be treated like Japan. They want to be treated like Brazil. They want to be treated like other countries. And that's the choice, whether we're going to treat them that way and bring them into the fold or keep isolating them. And that's, that's the bargain we're stuck with. And they're not good guys and they're not stable. But that's, the, that's, the, that's why I believe nuclear weapons are so dangerous. And that's why it's so important to gain a sense of the nuances that Ambassador Graham has given us today. I hope you'll pick up some of the literature that we have. And I want to thank the international law students that have put this together, particularly Kevin Krauss, who did the work to do this. And I want to thank some of the people that I see in the audience of civil society groups that work on this issue. Charlie Day from the Project for Nuclear Awareness that I commend to your attention. And Jules Zacker from the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. That there are numerous civil society groups looking at these issues with sobriety and sophistication. They're not just claiming let's live in some utopia, but let's get to serious work. And on that, I'd like, to, I'd like us all particularly to give a hearty applause to both the students that put this together and especially Ambassador Graham. feeling that would happen. I had, a, I had a feeling that mic might not be back on, so I'll use this one. As Professor Granoff said, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And we hope that this evening was not only informative in an eye-opening way, but also inspiring in light of our duty as a global society to safeguard future generations. Because as our Professor Rani once said through some of his research, a quote by former President Ronald Reagan, What's so great about a world which can be blown up in 30 seconds? <laughs> and we hope that you take what you've learned here tonight home with you, and as well as take home some of the other material we have available for CLE attendees as well. That's, all, that's available for everyone to take home with you. And stay tuned in the spring for when we uh, in institute part two, which would be to uh, form a position paper, which we would then send out. And please remember our networking reception, which is in the room directly adjacent to this room, which is 247. The International Law Society and Widener Law has provided a, a wonderful spread of food, which has been internationally inspired. <laughs> so on behalf of the International Law Society, we would like to give a special thanks to everyone in this room, the Wilmington Chapter of People to People, the Global Security Institute, the International Law Society, all of the students, not just me, I, I have a, a whole group of students who helped me create this. And without you guys and our two speakers, we wouldn't be able to have all of you here today. So we thank you, and have a wonderful night. <laughs>